Hey everyone, I'm Dave Merrill and I'm the Connections Pastor here at The Gathering. I want to thank you for checking out this week's sermon video. I hope you find it meaningful and enjoyable. I also want to let you know that the sermon video is just one piece of our full online worship experience. When you attend our online worship, you can do things like watch the sermon, join us in singing, connect with others via our chat feature, practice generosity through our giving feature, and even submit your own prayer requests. So if you aren't able to join us live, be sure to connect with us weekly at gatheringnow.churchonline.org. I look forward to seeing you there, and I hope you enjoy the sermon. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings, with year old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you. To do justice and embrace faithful love and walk humbly with your God. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Gathering. It's great to have you in worship with us today. Uh, if you've never been here before, my name is Matt Miofsky, and I'm the lead pastor at The Gathering. And we are one church, but we meet in four different locations around the city. And so most of the time I'm preaching live, but occasionally I'll be preaching via video like today. But we're really glad to have you here. Last week, if, if you weren't here, I talked about some of the unrest in St. Louis, the protests and the events of this past week. And we looked at that through the lens of the Old Testament uh, book of Esther. And inevitably, anytime I talk about something sensitive, something somewhat controversial, I, I get feedback. I always do. And, and a part of that feedback will be from people who have a, a common criticism. They'll say something like, Matt, I, I don't think it's appropriate that you talk about social things or political issues. I'd like you to, to stay to the spiritual as one person told me, they said, I, I like my church and I like my religion apolitical. And if you've ever felt that, like, I get it. I really do understand that. It's pretty common criticism of pastors who choose to delve into social issues or issues that might be considered political or have something to do with our life together. I can remember early on in uh, one of my first churches, I arrived and in that first week, somebody took me out to eat. And we went to a really nice country club. We have a nice meal. And at the end, the person said to me, they said, you know, man, I really just have one piece of advice. Uh, don't ever talk about politics from the pulpit and you should be fine. And, and warnings like that, it's enough to make a lot of pastors just stick to a faith that is personal and private and about you and your relationship with God and maybe your family. Uh, but to stay out of things that are social or that could be considered political. But, but I want to say to do that, on the one hand, for pastors like me, I mean, to do that makes it a life a lot easier. It's safer. It's certainly less controversial. But it also makes for a faith that's not exactly biblical. Because biblical faith isn't just about our lives, like what impacts me and my relationship with God. It's not just about our family or our little street, but, but it's about how we see the world and the issues that we confront in the world. And as proof that faith has to consider how we live our public life, our social life, what some people might call our political life, we don't need to look much further than the message of the Old Testament prophets. Now, we're in this sermon series, Small But Mighty, and the, uh, the subtitle is Little Known Books of the Bible. What we're doing is every week we're picking one of those really short books of the Bible that we usually flip past, and we're, we're looking at what's contained there, because oftentimes they have really mighty messages that we need to pay attention to. And a classic example of those kinds of books come at the end of your Old Testament. If any of you ever flipped open your Bible, you know, you get to the end of your Old Testament, and there are 12 books all packed together. They're the ones that have, you know, the really weird names that are hard to pronounce. They don't take up very much space. I mean, maybe about that much space in our Bible. And what those 12 books are called is they're called the Minor Prophets. They're part of what we call the prophetic tradition. They're called the minor prophets because they're short, as opposed to the major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, which are really long books. 
But together, these books make up what we call in the church the prophetic tradition. And it's a, it's a critical part of the Bible, but it's a part of the Bible that so often we overlook. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk about one of those little books. It's a book called Micah about a prophet by the name of Micah. And I'm, I'm picking it in part because it's interesting in and of itself, but in part because it's kind of a stand-in for what so much of the prophetic tradition is meant to teach us, and yet so often we don't pay enough attention to. But before I get into that, let me introduce you to Micah. Who in the world was Micah? Well, as I said, Micah was a prophet who lived in Jerusalem, and he lived during the 700s. Now, to understand Micah, and really to understand all the prophets, we, we have to understand a little bit about the, the history and the time period in which most of them lived. See, they lived during very precarious times in the, the nation of Israel. Uh, Micah lived during a time shortly after the death of King David, a few generations past the, the death of, of King David, maybe uh, two, three hundred years later. And by this time, what had happened to, to Israel is it had split into two kingdoms. There was a, a northern kingdom, and that was called Israel, and it had a capital in Samaria. I brought a little map so you guys can see it. And there was a southern kingdom, and the southern kingdom was called Judah, and it had its capital as Jerusalem. And Micah was living in the southern kingdom, in the city of Jerusalem, but he was writing about both kingdoms because what happened is when they split, they became more vulnerable. And as soon as they became more vulnerable, all sorts of foreign powers began attacking them. And during Micah's life, those attacks came in the form of a, a big empire called the Assyrian Empire. That empire would eventually conquer the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom would last a little longer, but later on it would get conquered by the Babylonians. And it was just during this, this political time of uncertainty and unrest and war that, that almost all of the prophets uh, did their work. Now, that's the historical setting. But right alongside that, I want to explain something about the religious beliefs, because this was important for the prophets as well. The religious beliefs uh, of most Jews of the time went something like this, like we're God's chosen people. God made a promise to David that his kingdom would last forever. Therefore, even though all these foreign powers are attacking us, we'll be fine because God is with us. And in fact, most of the, the priests, most of the preachers of the day uh, preached something like that. Yeah, do better, but ultimately we're fine because God's with us. God's going to protect us. None of this is going to matter. But, but it was in that context that the prophets came along and they had a really different take on things. The message of Micah and so many of the prophets went something like this. You're not fine. <laughs> yes, God was, was with you, but, but we're not living up to our end of the covenant. We're not living together the way that God wants us to live. So because of that, God is going to let these foreign powers conquer us. That's going to be the punishment for us not paying attention to the way that God wants us to to live. Now, you can imagine uh, that the prophets were not popular people. You go around saying, hey, things aren't good. Things aren't as fine as the preacher down the street says that they are. We need to pay attention to some things that we're not paying attention to. You can see why uh, the tradition was that the prophets were stoned and, and thrown out of the cities. They didn't like to hear this message. And yet that was the jobs of, of prophets, and that was the job of, of Micah. And so the, the book of Micah is essentially a manifesto about what the people of Israel are doing wrong, what God wants them to be doing, and what's going to happen to them if they keep on ignoring God's command. So what was it that they were doing so wrong? I mean, what would justify such a stiff punishment, like a foreign power coming in and, and coming in and sweeping them away? I mean, what in the world was so bad about what they were, were doing? Were they committing murder? Were they stealing? Were they you know, smoking behind the house or having sex before marriage or drinking before they're 21 or not going to church? I mean, what in the world was so bad about these people that it could justify such a warning like the one that Micah was giving them? Well, the short answer is... Nothing. The individual people that Micah 
was talking to, I mean, they weren't these awful, evil people. They weren't necessarily doing anything that was all that wrong, in fact. The, the problem during Micah's time wasn't what these individual people were doing. It was about what they were ignoring. Some of you have heard of sins of omission. Have you heard of that? I mean, this is a classic example. Micah is critiquing the people, not because as individuals they were doing bad things, but as people it was about what they were not doing that Micah was upset. And so if you read the, the prophets... The sins that they lift up aren't these individual sins of morality, not things usually like murder or individual acts of stealing or not going to synagogue enough or anything like that. If you read the prophets and especially the book of Micah, the, the things that they lift up are, are rather public issues. They're public things that are plaguing Israel, and yet no one wants to take responsibility for them. So you take, for example, the book of Micah. If any of you read it in preparation, it's a little bit hard to understand, but, but Micah is really going after wealthy people of his days, going after the, the lending and financial institutions and the justice system. I mean, specifically, he begins the book by criticizing lenders and wealthy landowners who who seize on the poor during uncertain times. In fact, an example of this is Micah chapter 2, verse 2, when he says, they, that's the, the lenders, they covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They oppress a householder and those in his house, a man in his estate. He's critiquing these opportunistic financial people who during uncertain times would loan money and then foreclose and take uh, homes. And for Micah, what added insult to injury is when these, when these landowners tried to go to the justice system, to the, to the political leaders and the judges to do something about it, they would turn a blind eye. And so he writes in, in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, But I said, hear, leaders of Jacob, rulers of the house of Israel, isn't your job to know justice? Like, isn't your job to take care of this? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin off them and the flesh off their bones. What Micah is saying is not only are there these practices all over the kingdom that are hurting people who are poor, but then they go to the justice system and the people who are supposed to be for justice are turning a blind eye to them. See, for Micah, the, the sin of Israel was that they were not paying attention to these injustices that were happening right in their midst. Injustices that were helping the rich and hurting the poor. That may seem kind of weird, but this wasn't an uncommon issue, especially for the prophets. And so if you read the rest of the prophets, what you find is a pattern that, that while much of the Bible might speak to our personal lives and our personal prayer life or how we act or what we do to relate to God, the, the prophets have a little bit of a different bend. The prophets are often critiquing something bigger than a personal behavior or two. They so often are critiquing public issues, bigger systems that leave some people behind, things that are unfair or inequitable or unjust. And so if you, you read the prophets, you'll read about all sorts of things. You'll read about economic policies and, and lending practices and housing issues and poverty and social injustice and legal corruption and political greed and power grabbing. In all of this, the prophets say people of faith ought to, to care about. And so what we get from Micah, and really it's the overriding message of all the prophets, is this. That God doesn't just care about how you live your personal individual life. But God cares about how we structure our society. God cares about how we live our life together. God cares about that aspect of our life that we might call social or maybe even political. And, and, and so here's the point that Micah was making. It's not enough to be a good person. It's not enough for us to make sure that we're not making serious mistakes. If we live in a bad system, then we have to do something about it. Good people who are caught in a bad system are obligated to make the system work, not just for them, 
but for everyone. That's not a political statement. That's a God thing. That's a biblical statement, and that's a point that Micah is trying to make. It sounds like something that could have been written in 2017 for the United States or the state of Missouri or right here for our own city in St. Louis. You know, the truth is, I had chosen Micah to, to preach on long before uh, the events of the past few weeks. But, but even in light of what we're living through right now, I think that, that maybe we need to hear this message as much or more uh, than Israel did some 2,700 years ago. I think we as people of faith, this is really important. Like, it's not enough to say, like, we're Christian. It's not enough to, to just care about our personal lives and make sure that we don't mess up and make sure we have a good prayer life and make sure we go to worship and make sure we're reading the Scripture and make sure our own family is doing what it needs to do to stay faithful. I mean, those are good things. Don't get me wrong. But it's not enough just to make faith something that applies to our life. Faith has to change the way that we begin to see the world around us. Sometimes we're guilty, not for what we do, but for what we don't do. Not for the things that we cause, but for the things that we ignore or we fail to do anything about. You know, from time to time, many of you know the, United, the, the gatherings of United Methodist Church, right? And people will ask me, Matt, why is... The Gathering United Methodist, what's important about that? D does it really matter? And, and I'll say, yeah, it matters. I mean, that part of our identity is actually really important. And then people will ask me, like, why? What is it about Methodists that makes it so special that we want to be identified with it? And, and one of the things I go back to is, is this aspect of our faith. If, if you look back in our history, John Wesley was an Anglican priest. He lived in England, and he was the founder of the, the Methodist movement. And as some of you know, I traveled to England a couple of years ago, and I visited some of the Wesley sites. I've talked about that here in church. But one of the most meaningful parts of, of that trip for me was going to London, where Wesley was a priest of an Anglican church. But, but so many people were part of this small group movement, this, this Methodist movement that he was starting, that he decided to do something. He, he ended up buying this big cannon factory. It was an abandoned cannon factory, and that's where the Methodists would meet. They would meet and worship and study the Bible. But then something happened to Wesley. See, he was living in London at a time when the Industrial Revolution was just beginning. And, and the neighborhood all around this factory was uh, just getting inundated with some of the problems of the Industrial Revolution. A lot of people from rural places were moving to the city. They were poor. They couldn't find homes. They didn't have uh, access to care or education. And, and Wesley looked around, and, and he was convicted not only by what he saw around him, but by what the, the prophets in, in the Bible seemed to, to say. That, that if faith was really going to be a biblical faith, it couldn't just be about individual people, but he had to pay attention to the, to the things that were happening around him. And, and so pretty soon, he, he took that cannon factory, it was called the Foundry, and the you know, first thing he did is he started a health care clinic in it providing health care to people who otherwise couldn't get it. And then he started a pharmacy so that those people could get access to some of the medicines that they couldn't get anywhere else. Then he noticed that kids in these poor neighborhoods couldn't go to school, and so he started a free school right there in, in the building. Pretty soon he, he realized that that people couldn't get access to money, so he started a little lending institution, and then eventually even a, a, a housing uh, ministry so that people could get access to housing. All of this ended up being in this one cannon factory. Why? Because Wesley deeply believed that people of faith, in part because of the prophets, that, that people of faith needed to pay attention not just to their lives, but to what was happening in the lives of people around them. And so for the past hundred years, Methodists have, have cared and stood up for all sorts of things that we've been criticized for, that other people might say are too social or too political, but, but that Methodists see as part of their faith. So Methodists have stood up for workers' rights and women's suffrage and child labor laws and gambling and unfair tax systems and payday loans, civil rights, health care, and the list goes on 
and on. And while this opens the church up to being criticized sometimes as being too social or too political, I think what it means is that we're Christian. So fast forward. There's a reason I'm giving you this history. Fast forward to today. We at the gathering believe deeply in a personal faith. I mean, I want more than anything for you to to discover and commit your life to Christ and grow every day in becoming more Christ-like, understanding what that means for you and reading the scripture and and praying and, and teaching that to your family. But we at the gathering also believe that faith is about more than just our personal lives. We think that God cares about how we live our life together. And it's not enough for us to be good if we stand by and ignore things that are not good out in the world. And I say that because I want you to understand why I challenge us sometimes with issues that you may think are a bit political. It's why I speak up about racism. It's why I I talk about discrimination against gay and lesbian people. It's why I write posts sometimes about immigration and and every once in a while wade into topics that, that many think are too political. But but we live in a culture where I think way too many people, way too many Christians, in fact, want to see faith as a personal thing, but want to ignore the way that faith changes the way that we see our public life. And like I said before, that would be nice. That would be convenient to not have to pay attention to that. It would be safer that way, but it wouldn't be Christian, and it certainly wouldn't be biblical. Micah reminds us that that God cares about things beyond our walls and wants us to care about things beyond our lives. And and I'm not telling you what to care about or what opinion to form, but I I am challenging you to, to care. I mean, the book of Micah essentially ends with this courtroom scene. And and I have to read it to you because it is the most powerful words in the the book of Micah. In in chapter 6, At the end, there's this courtroom scene, and the whole idea is God is bringing the people to court. And it says this in Micah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Hear what the Lord is saying. Arise, lay out the lawsuit. Lay it out before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. So God's laying out this lawsuit before the, the mountains. And God begins to recount all the things that he's done for, for people. And then he bemoans the fact that they, they haven't done the things that God wants them to do. And so if you skip down to verse 6, it, it has the people asking God, like, God, what gives? Like, what is it that you want from us? What are we not doing that you want? That's what they say in Micah chapter 6, verse 6. With, when they say this, with what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings? With year-old calves, which by the way were very expensive. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my spirit? In other words, the people are saying, God, what more do you want from us? I mean, do you need a thousand rams or, or better sacrifices? I mean, what do you want me to do? Give up my firstborn kid? What is it that you're expecting of me? And Micah's answer comes back really simply. Verse 8. He has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires from you, but to do justice, to embrace faithful love or loyalty, and to walk humbly with God. In other words, I don't want another sacrifice. It's not about another prayer, or it's not about you being more pious. What I want you to do is to care about justice, to care about loving kindness, not just to you, but to others, to walk humbly with me and to see the world the way that I see it. You know, many years later, Jesus would critique the Pharisees for much the same thing. He would say, you're excellent at following all the the personal laws that make you very religious, but you're ignoring the weightier matters, things like justice and peacefulness, and faith. A 
Friends, I challenge us because faith has to be about more than just us. As Micah points out, we are not much good if we as individuals seek to follow God but then ignore the way that we live our life together. And the challenge is that, that we may not contribute to, the, to, to all that. We may not have set it up. We not have, may not play much of a part in creating it. But God tells us that our job is to care about it nonetheless. There's so much we could apply this, this passage to. But, but let me just give you one example. About a year and a half ago, the gathering began the Literacy Project. And part of the genesis of that was, was Micah, uh, texts like this, which we said as a church, it's not enough that we give money, but there's so many injustices in our city. What do we want to do about it as the gathering? And we picked education. You look at education, and it's hard to argue with the, the inequity in education. I mean, it's so obvious. Like, when you look around, like, I send my kid to school, and when I send my kid to school, they're going to a classroom that's been prepared for them, a teacher that is well-trained and resourced. They're, they're going into a room where every kid gets their own iPad or their own Chromebook. It has state-of-the-art equipment, a library full of books, a, a bunch of parents involved, a building that is updated and well-kept, an administration that's focused on excellence, and all that is supported by a lot of money. I mean, that's where I can send my kid to school. And then just 10 miles from where I live, you can, you can look and and there's a whole different story. There, there are kids who have to walk through a metal detector to get into a building that hasn't been updated in a, a long time, into a classroom with teachers who are under-resourced, who oftentimes have to scrape together their own money just to get basic supplies. They have to go to libraries that haven't been able to buy new books in, in a long time. And they have to do it without a lot of outside support, with an administration that lacks resources. I mean, you look at that, just something as simple as that. It's hard to look at that and say that that's right or that's good or that's fair, that God doesn't care about that. We believe that faith demands that we care about things like that. And so that's why we started our literacy project. That's why this past weekend over 90 mentors were trained. They're going to go down and, and invest in the lives of 45 to 50 kids, teaching them, them, them to read. It's a small part, but it's a way of us addressing a system that we don't think is fair and we don't think is just. See, the people of God shouldn't overlook things like this. And that's the reason sometimes we have to get a little social in here. We have to get a little bit political. It's, it's the reason why we have to pay attention to things like race or the justice system or health care, policing or lending policies or gentrification or food stamps or global warning or immigration or whatever else you, you want to say. Are these political things? Sure. Can people of good faith respond to them differently? Absolutely. I'm not asking that you take a particular stance. I'm not asking that you become a Republican or become a Democrat. What I'm asking you to do as a Christian is to at least care. And so that's what I want to leave you with today. Here's where I want to challenge you. Prophets like Micah remind us that faith is about more than my relationship to God. Faith is about neighbors and others and how we live our life together. So here's your challenge. Care about something outside yourself. L let yourself be nudged to see or care about something that even though it may not impact you, impacts others. A and let God know that you see it, that you recognize that it's not right, that it's unfair, that it's unjust, that it's not the way that God would want things. And then do something about it. Because the Lord requires more of us than just going to church or reading the Bible or focusing on our own life with God. But the Lord requires this of us, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God. Let's pray. God, we believe that, that you called us to be a church for a reason. 
And we are grateful, God, for all the people um, sitting here who, who you are speaking to, for all of us that are finding new life in, in you, who are, who are addressing matters in our lives, in our marriages, and in our families, with our friends, maybe in our jobs. But God, today, help us to see also that you want our faith to affect the way that we see our city, our state, our country, the world. Maybe issues that we don't personally deal with, but that we know are not the way that you would want them to be. So God, give us the eyes to see. Give us the courage to follow nudges when we have them. Help us to care about things that, that are not right, even if they don't affect us. And ultimately, God, help us to be your hands and feet and to get involved in doing something. God, make us people, as Jesus said, who get the weightier matters of the law, people who, who do justice, who love kindness, and who see the world humbly through your eyes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.